Hello and welcome to Talking Point. I'm your host Neeraj Shah. It's the it's the day of the big Fed decision. All Fed meetings are watched out for. All Jackson Hole symposiums are watched out for. This is different because this may be the start of a change in stance. I'm using the term may because it's never done until it's done. The street is working maybe with the 50 basis points as well of, of rate cut. But, you know, before we get in our guests, I just want to lay out what the current status of the Fed move is and, and, and the expectations thereof and what's the resultant impact on India or other emerging markets as a result of this. So let me try and pull up some uh, words on, on this wall to try and tell you what's current, what's to be watched out for. So the Fed mid begins, has begun, and the decision will be out today. The market is currently pricing in a 62% possibility of a 50 basis points rate cut. This has moved up, by the way, from about 25 basis points of a rate cut belief, which was there about a month ago. So therefore, there is a change in the market expectation of what the Fed will do. Now, the point is, viewers, what if, what if we do not get a 25 basis points cut? So, the, you know, the reason why I say this is because official figures showed yesterday, by the way, that the U.S. retail sales in August were stronger than expected and the financial situation uh, and the financial conditions in the U.S. are the loosest since April 2022 as per Goldman Sachs. So there is a possibility that we might not get a 50 basis points as well. Uh, Peter Maguire today was saying that there are outside talks of even 75, but I'm saying that even 50 is not a done deal as yet. So that's the first key thing to watch out for. Uh, and that may thwart the party for risk assets a little bit. But the point is the real policy rate Z score. And I'll first lay out the numbers and I'll tell you the importance of this. Whether we get 25 or 50 basis points, this is important. Now, India on the real policy rate Z score is at 2.1, Indonesia 1.8, Philippines and South Korea 1.5, Thailand about 0 0.8. Why, is, why are these numbers important? The graphics will come up on your screen next. They are important because the Z score refers to the standard deviation of the current real rate relative to the five-year average. Simply put, if this is confusing you, simply put, a higher Z score means higher real rates. And therefore, India at 2.1 has higher real, real rates relative to the rest of the pack. For Indian reasons, but I mean, for reasons which are very specific to India, but there is a higher Z score. And therefore, the possibility of the rates coming down in India, if the Fed were to be the trigger point for that, or if lower inflation were to be the trigger point for that, or both. So therefore, the possibility of rates coming off in India are probably that much higher. And if that were to happen, it makes a fixed income a very important asset class to look at. In fact, Abundi, in an interview to Bloomberg, has laid out that real rates across Southeast Asian economies are also higher than a year ago, which suggests room to ease a situation likely to benefit the local bond market. Now, remember, viewers, what does this do? If indeed this is going to benefit the local bond market, plus our bonds are now a part of the JP Morgan um, Global Bond Index and a few other indices, as the case may be, in times to come, it could be very constructive for the Indian bond markets as well. So do, do the market look away from equities completely and look at bonds, or do the markets look at both? Or is there a case that because of the perceived higher valuations, don't look at equities and look at bonds. Well, I, our guest today will, will tell me, Neeraj, you are not talking sense because he's been a proponent of equities at a point of time when everybody was talking about equities being expensive uh, right around the election period as well. Since then, the markets have rallied another 2,000, 3,000 points. Vikas Kimani, founder of Carnelian Asset Management and Advisors, with us on the show today. Vikas, so good having you. Thanks for taking the time out. I hope all is well. Absolutely, it's always good to speak with you. Thank you very much for having me. No, the pleasure is entirely ours, Vikas, I must tell you that, because it's such an important day ahead of the Fed meet. Now, Vikas, tell me, first, plainly, would a Fed decision or 25 or 50 basis points, what do you expect, by the way, there? And would that decision be material for global equities and for Indian equities? I think, Neeraj, 
uh, the, this boat has sailed according to me. It does not matter it is 25 or 50 basis point according to me. Uh, the fact that the direction has changed. And I think that has been more important. Now, I mean, that 25 to 50 basis point can be important for a trader or a, or a, or a you know, a short term player. But somebody who is investing from a long term, medium to long term perspective, the direction is more important. And as you remember in our previous conversation also about six, eight months ago, we said that Fed rate has peaked out. And what time it turns or it uh, you know, changes is a matter of six to 12 months. Nobody can predict that. And I think now that one thing is very clear that the boat has sailed, the tide has turned. Now, whether it starts with 25 or 50, that's not important. But from an Indian market perspective, why it is more important is Whenever Fed rates raises interest rates, most U.S. investors pull out money from the emerging markets because the typical rule book is, you know, uh, as Fed raises interest rates, emerging market import inflation, interest rates increases, and the equities weaken. And hence, and as the Fed peaks out and start reducing emerging market receipts flow, and that is what precisely happened in India. We dis, uh, we lost a lot of, you know, we saw a lot of outflow from foreigners. And now we are beginning to see, as the indication of turn has happened, we are already beginning to see good flows. So according to me, a uh, significance of this from Indian context is that we will see a significant fund flow cycle beginning over next many years uh, from foreign investors towards Indian markets and emerging markets. Okay. So because uh, uh, the, the belief or, or the whole thing has been that flows, I mean, in the last two, three weeks, flows have started to some of the cheaper Asian markets already, Indonesia, uh, and, and the likes, right? We, we are starting to see some flows in the last three or four days towards India as well. Would you see the color of the money being passive or would active foreign money also come in? Because everybody talks about one thing, oh, valuations are expensive. I know you don't, but a lot of people do. I know you're a believer. You're saying, you've told me in the past that you know valuations may be expensive, but there is growth. I'm trying to ask you, what color of foreign money will come in? Precisely, I will say that, you know, like I said, I will probably correct you the point you meant money is moving towards cheaper markets. So money is moving towards the emerging market or money is moving away from the emerging market. Now, within that, there is an overweight, underweight allocation happens. Like, for example, when last three years when emerging markets were losing money, India also lost money, but India on a relative basis lost lesser money because India was looking more promising. Same way when money is coming back, initially money might go more towards the markets where they were underweight, right? which could be in your definition, the cheaper markets. But my point is that this money is allocation money. And then within that, like, you know, let's say if you give me any investor, give me money uh, to invest into equities, I might do that allocation in different sectors. Same way money allocated towards emerging market will do different in different markets based on their own conviction. The point is that overall, overall water levels are going up, overall flows are going up, and India will surely be beneficial on that. Some investor within that basket might find India might expensive uh, and might not allocate. But in general, I see a situation that no uh, you know, allocator of the emerging market can ignore India. Uh, you know, cannot be underweight India because India is one of the most promising market from a growth standpoint of view. You cannot see this kind of sustainable growth in any market in the emerging market space. And hence, my conviction is that India will receive very large flows. All right. You know, I read an article uh, when maybe Vikas Kiman gave an interview to a uh, to a to a newspaper. Uh, which said that if indeed markets are so expensive, why aren't they correcting? And that's true, viewers, that markets aren't quite correcting. Now, because the, I want to ask you the contra question as well. Uh, now that India has eclipsed China in the MSCI EM IMI uh, weightage, and as per Morgan Stanley's note, very soon might eclipse China on the overall weightages as well, could the converse happen that everybody is saying that, oh, India might be expensive or some people are saying, let's say that India might be expensive and therefore flows might be muted. Can the converse happen that because of India's weightage, we might be surprised by the quantum of foreign flows that come in in this easing cycle? Can that happen? Absolutely. I think we will be surprised. We will have a deluge of money and in fact, we will have an avalanche of money coming into Indian markets. Uh, you know, now whether timing and pace, I can't really, uh, I mean, it could be one year, two year, three year, but you know, the fact, just, just imagine, just in, analyze. I mean, China is a one market where US investors aren't allocating. There's a huge, uh, this thing happening. 
uh, which is the large market where you can deploy billions and billions of dollars you know with the with the confidence of uh, uh, growth coming around and where you have the democracy when you have the you know very solid corporate governance system where you have the growth where you have so there's no market you know if you ask me i mean yes markets like indonesia but how much capital they can absorb so point is that when money comes this india is a very 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 large market and fortunately the size depth of market is increasing one side when people complain about a lot of ipos and supply coming in yes this supply is essential for for this absorption of this money which is going to come in and that is a happy news that's not a bad, bad news and you know the the glimpse of this you can see when japanese economic cycle uh, economic miracle played out you know lots of investors flocked to japan you know between 1965 to 1989 was a bull uh, market for japan and you know initially lots of skepticism was there but towards the end you know in in 70 late 70s late 80s the, the there was no investor you know, globally, who was not going towards in Japan despite being expensive. And Japan, mind you, peaked at 60 times Nikkei, P of Nikkei in 1989. So, so I think, you know, I'm not making a point that what P yeah. will trade, Indian markets will trade, but the point I'm directionally trying to tell you that when the money comes in, you know, it just sort of, uh, in a location money, it finds way to a market. And uh, I do believe that, uh, and by the way, one data also must, one must keep in mind, US, as a percentage of the world market cap today is 61%. Last time it peaked at 51%. So you, you, how much more money US can absorb and, and the fact that you know the rate cut cycle is beginning, there's also case can be made out that you know US economy will be soft. Hence you might not have the same kind of uh, uh, same kind of sort of equity story going forward there. So there aren't many equity markets with a good story going around the globe. And hence I see that you know we all will keep getting surprised with the amount of money flow which will come both from domestics as well as foreigners. Got it. Because one, one counter question to the point that you just made. So paper, paper coming in, primary paper coming in is probably welcome because it will absorb so much of liquidity that is sloshing around both domestic and global which will come in. But a, a lot of people point towards how PE exits and founder exits are happening and whether that's a sign. In the past, that used to be considered a sign, right? Promoter bech raha hai, uh, he knows something more than the street does, therefore go out. But I see people like you as well, buying out those large chunks of, of paper, wherein a PE firm which has been there for around exits, or maybe in some cases even the promoter is selling some stake. What do you say about that? There could be many reasons why people sell, right? A lot of promoters selling could be a reason for people haven't seen this kind of wealth for a long period of time. So when you see this kind of wealth, A, part of safety thing triggers in. B, I think many generational, uh, you know, next generation is not interested. So, you know, one... Uh, you know, some many first generation entrepreneurs, second families are selling businesses either to PE or to, you know, the, to, to markets. So I think it is very much similar to, by the way, what happened in 80s in US. You know, many businesses, so basically the difference between promoter and management is getting bigger and bigger. Today we have five, seven companies listed in the markets without promoter. There are no promoter to that, you know, board run companies. Incrementally, this number will keep going in. Buying business, selling business will become very, very easy, is becoming easy. So this is, you can see this trend happening, playing out exactly how it happened in US. Uh, business will acquire size, scale, tuck-in acquisitions will happen. All those things are, I think, you know, par for the course will happen. Private equity funds sell for, you know, because the life cycle is over, they, but they are deploying more capital back into the market. It's not that they're net net taking away money from market, right? In fact, somebody wrote a very, one newspaper wrote a very interesting thing that, you know, in 2020, uh, promoters sold post-pandemic almost 60, 65,000 worth of equity stocks. Now, go back and do the mark to market of that, whether that, that was a smart decision or a bad decision. The point is, you know, selling uh, by promoters does not necessarily mean only that, uh, it's negative. Of course, you have to look at the situation. You have to look at the company. I'm not making any blanket uh, sort of uh, comment. Uh, but yeah, you have to you know see uh, India story in right perspective. According to me, we are in a very very transformative phase, um, uh, and you have to of course individually analyze individual opportunity sector management. But we will be creating one of the you know largest wealth or as you know uh, basically you know 80 90 percent of india's wealth is yet to be made uh, over the next 20 25 years so we are in that kind of cycle and once you have that then i guess uh, idea is to just remain invested and sit through pains which come and go i tell you viewers whenever you are slightly more skeptical 
about the Indian markets. You've got to hear Vikas Kemani, not just this interview, really. I mean, the interview has been bullish and constructive for a long time. For now, it's paying off. Uh, so keep that in mind. Vikas, where within this whole landscape are you more constructive on? Because different people, I mean, there are many thousand ways to skin a cat. But I'm trying to understand how does Vikas Kemani think about this? So I think, you know, again, uh, India is one of the very widest story in my 25, 30 years of career. I haven't seen uh, so many sectors playing out. You have great opportunities in manufacturing, you have great opportunities in financials, technology, consumption, infrastructure. I mean, it's one of those periods where, you know, things are happening at a great space and interesting space in every aspect. And this is one of the most widespread balancing growth. Uh, you have a domestic consumption story, you have export story, you have manufacturing story, you have services story. So, you know, so this is where I think we are, in my opinion, again, spoiled for choices that we can pick up what we like and our focus continues to remain great quality managements in good businesses and at a reasonable valuation. And mind you, I am again telling you, leader, you are able to find out despite no matter what people you know make the narrative about. Uh, to give an idea, in our Bharat Amrit Kal Fund, our portfolio earning growth is 22-23%. ROE of the portfolio is 19-19.5%. Uh, you know, debt to equity is 0.1. Uh, you know, peg ratio is you know 1-1.1. So you are able to find reasonably priced uh, people who make the argument of expensive, I think, are approaching markets from reversion to mean perspective. But that doesn't work in a transformative economy. Uh, you know, reversion to mean works in a steady state economy. But transformative economy, reversion to mean doesn't work. And that's the reason we need to study and understand different, different markets. And my conviction is that, you know, there are many, many pockets of, uh, uh, you know, opportunities within those segments I spoke about. Each has to find its own comfort and, you know, build portfolios. Such a valid point in some sense, because uh, where with, I mean, I, okay, just help us understand this better, right? Because you said it's a wide bucket. Where is it that, I'm not asking for stock recommendations here, but where is it that you are more constructive on within this transformative set? I mean, there might be 10 themes that you really like. Tell us about one or two where you believe that things are changing in such a transformative way that the sector earnings will look materially different, let's say five years out. So I think again, manufacturing. We've been speaking about for a very, very long period of time, and but that's a wide bucket. Because, basket, sorry, but that's a basket. wide bucket. Because yes, I'm yes. Sorry that's that, so I, narrow it down. Yeah. So I know, I know. I'm, I'm coming to that. So I think that's a very wide basket. Basket. But within that, I think, in my opinion, auto auto components will keep surprising. You know, um, markets. The great story in in, in place. Um, we will keep seeing it within pharmaceutical. CDMO is a space. I think is a where where probably where IT was in mid 90s, and it's a very very massive. Uh, 10, 12 years, uh, 10, 20 years story, uh, you know, we'll keep surprising, uh, getting surprised on that. Within consumption, by the way, you know, we've been all along negative on consumption and its valuation for last five years. Last three, six months, we invested heavily. Uh, first time we are significantly overweight in the space, but we are able to find reasonably priced, good, high quality in the consumption stories where we can see 15, 20% growth coming through. Premiumization is playing out, customer spending is playing out. So, so you can, within IT, by the way, which is considered sl a relatively slower sector, uh, I think there are companies which are growing at 18, 18, 20% within ARND space, uh, uh, which is the fastest growing segment in, in that space. Uh, product oriented companies, again, are growing very, very well. You can find those companies also in this space. So look, there are pockets of opportunities. You know, we, we, we look at broader theme and then go and narrow down within that space what grows faster, what grows, uh, delivers better risk reward, and then we look for those kind of ideas. Got it. Well, you know, because mentioned about how CDMO is at a place where IT was, I want to dwell on a little bit on the present as well, because just stay on, because I need to get in my colleague Rucha to talk about what's ailing IT services today, because from amongst, uh, in a very, very flat market per se, Nifty IT is sulking big time in trade today. Rucha, what could the probable reasons be? Right, so Nifty IT is falling in trade today and this is uh, largely on the back of one news that came out in Accenture where Accenture is set to uh, delay its staff promotion uh, from June to December. Now, this uh, this is the information according to Bloomberg and Bloomberg reports that Accenture had uh, told its employees in an internal email that they are also considering to permanently uh, shift the promotion cycle from June to December. Now, I'll tell you why will this be happening. Uh, now, clients set, generally set their budget in December for the coming up calendar year. So 
if the December uh, cycle comes into the picture with respect to employee promotion, the company gets better clarity with respect to how clients are looking onto their budgets and then the company can decide onto their expenditure like employees, ESOP costs, etc. So this might be the reason why Accenture is considering to get a better clarity on demand. Now talking about IT as a whole, well, City had come out with a note on Accenture per se, the global team, when it did mention that surveys point to relative demand stability. Now mind you that over the last couple of quarters, demand was into pressure because of uh, uh, different macro uncertainties like war, interest rate, etc. But now the surveys uh, conducted by City indicates that there is relative demand stability, if not a dip in demand. Also, clients are, however, cautiously optimistic towards CY25 budget, which means that CY25, that is calendar year 25, will likely be better than calendar year 24. But different events like the uh, federal meeting which we have uh, and the election cycle which is coming up this year could also affect uh, clients' budget and hence the budget could uh, also affect how much they spend on IT and hence uh, reflect in the revenue for IT companies. Now, uh, pressure also continues to be on smaller discretionary deals. Now, discretionary happens when, you know, people, clients have to cut out on their budget to accommodate different expenditure uh, as well. So, pressure on smaller deals, uh, although continues and budget reprioritization is also happening by clients. But comparatively, like if we stand right now and if we compare uh, IT's outlook uh, back, uh, four quarters back, uh, we can see that right. there is relatively better green shoots, which even different companies had mentioned in the first quarter earnings. Yeah, point well noted. Rucha, thanks for bringing this, uh, that to us, Vikas. Uh, any thoughts here? You've been constructive IT. There has been a bit of a rally, but um, some of these rallies get punctured at times by um, some developments, the latest being Accenture saying that, hey, we'll do the promotions only six months out, and some people taking it as a sign of there being continued stress. So IT is one of the most closely watched sector, and I think, uh, you know, every small item gets used and, you know, or analyzed, and uh, I mean, my way of looking is very different. Look, again, while directionally, I think sector is bound to grow, uh, now you can argue whether it will go 8%, 10%, 12% or anybody's guess. I think NASCOM has given a great guidance in terms of like, you know, sector is growing. Uh, you know, uh, the only thing is we have to find out within that what offers better risk, what, what sector can grow, right? This year also IT sector has done very well. If you see uh, most IT, many IT stocks are up between 50 to 80%. And if you ask, look at last two years, you know, uh, many stock in our portfolio are up between 100% to 300%, right? So, you know, point is that while, of course, you know, very large IT companies will always have a challenge in terms of growing because the base is very large and bit of a dis, uh, inter internal changes are happening in terms of technology changes and they are kind of going through that phase. But fact is that directionally it's growing well. Uh, you know, uh, we are not negative on IT as a sector and I have said in the past also that, you know, I, uh, uh, IT is also a good play on Fed interest rates going down. And that has started playing out in the last six months, the moment indication of the Fed cutting it came down. Right? Still, in my opinion, a lot of transformative work uh, in US has not started. A lot of companies were so far spending only bare bone, you know, required money on IT development. But I think uh, the transformative or transformation work is yet to happen because every company needs to spend more on tech or more, more, needs to spend more on digital technologies. Otherwise, you won't be relevant. And still, there's large, wide opportunities on that. So I think we are constructive on the sector. Now, which company to play and all is a matter of, which segment to play is a matter of, you know, choice by each of, each of us. Uh, fair call. That's completely understandable. Uh, because uh, uh, what about... Uh, other forms of uh, uh, non-manufacturing space. So, for example, BFSI. I know from our previous conversation that you've told me that if India has to grow the way everybody envisages it to, banks are a sure shot presence there. What about non-banking names? I'm, we, we missed that part the last time that we spoke. So, both lending non-NBFCs and non-lending financials. Uh, how are you... How constructive are you? You may be constructive and all, but in the pecking order, do, do they come lower down in your overall portfolio or, or are they right up there? You know, in, in we could see some bit of, uh, you know, pressure on NIMS coming through and hence, you know, about six months ago, eight months ago, uh, we had more aligned our portfolio towards non-credit as well as non-bank. Uh, so we own fairly large NBFCs in our portfolio, which has done pretty well. Uh, we own, uh, you know, non-credit players, life insurance company, which has done again well. Uh, 
so I think we kind of made that, uh, you know, this, I, and that does not, you know, mean that we are not bullish on the credit segment, but there's a bit of intermittent, probably 12 months consolidation, 15 months consolidation possible. And hence, you kind of adjust your weights towards uh, uh, some of the names which you think can deliver better return in, in order to generate alpha. Both credit and non-credit are going to do well. I think, like, again, uh, if you take 10 to 15 year view, uh, whether it is insurance, whether it is wealth play, whether it is any segment, you think we are significantly underpenetrated. And as wealth creation happens, as per capita income goes through, more and more savings get channelized through the same sort of uh, two or three channels, whether it is you know capital markets, whether it is insurance companies, whether it is mutual funds. So all of them would be uh, you know growing reasonably well. We own AMCs because we think that they are structured in a good place. Uh, from a growth perspective. So so all these things, I think, uh, do us look very, very good. Uh, right now, we are a uh, little bit more overweight on non-credit and non-bank plays, but uh, we are not negative per se on banks as well. Okay. My final question, because I'm not asking you to comment on this one, but um, at times, it becomes my job to ask you about the most spoken about thing, and that is Bajaj Housing Finance. And the fact that yesterday, as of yesterday, the market cap of that one name eclipses the market cap of 10 subsequent housing finance names. Is this a sign of exuberance or is it the market playing, paying premium to a quality franchise? Uh, Bajaj Group obviously is most uh, sort of sought after. They always uh, been trading at a premium, uh, whether it is NBFC space or uh, this one. Uh, I think there's a huge sort of premium for that governance and execution, which well deserved. And Sanjeev is a good friend, so uh, you know, you know, very, very good. Uh, I mean, we and I mean, I, I don't this sort of we 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 uh, you know, in analyze that like the franchise, probably we find valuation slightly expensive at these levels where it is. But you know, look uh, to each his own. Uh, uh, I would not call it exuberance, but at the same time, I think, yes, we have to be careful. There are stocks where there's a lot of exuberance. There are no uh, stocks where you are able to find interesting plays. Market level, I still don't think we are in exuberance mode. Yes, there are pockets of signs, worry, risk are getting developed when you see poor quality companies also going public. Uh, good quality management going public and getting valuation is one aspect, but more worrying aspect to me is poor quality management, poor quality businesses going public and getting... Uh, uh, you know, good reception. That is my, in fact, bigger worry uh, where a lot of retail investors and, you know, lose money uh, permanently. And that is what I will always caution against. In, 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 in Bajaj housing kind of cases, you may not make money, but you will not lose money. And that's a, at least, you know, a good part. But so that's where I would say the exuberance should be avoided and we should be careful. Okay, because excuse me for making you talk on uh, a stock, but it was not a recommendation. But I just thought I should ask you because it's such a big talk of town. But thank you. Fabulous talking to you today. Thanks for so many insights that you've shared with us today. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Vikas. And viewers, thanks for tuning in to this edition of The Talking Point.